Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Clean Machine Live. I'm Jeff Palmer, CEO and founder of Clean Machine, uh, plant-based fitness nutrition. This video is for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Well, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, in the U.S., 75% of all healthcare dollars go to the treatment of chronic disease, with only 3% actually going towards prevention. That, to me, that's just horrible. That's, that's, that's a system that is approaching the problem from the wrong end. <laughs> you you want to stop the problem before it starts. You don't want to just try to make the best of the problem after it's already gone full blown. And the situation is where we know pretty much how to prevent these chronic diseases by and large through diet, through exercise, through nutritional intervention. We can by and large prevent the vast majority of these issues that people are experiencing that are shortening life, that are losing human hours in the workplace and that are costing our healthcare system billions, hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, when you look at the tax system, the vast majority of our taxes go to pay for healthcare. And military's right up there too with it. Uh, but if you if you don't like paying taxes, well then take better care of your health. <laughs> Because that is the major contributor to our tax burden is healthcare, And it's only going to get worse because America is getting sicker. Americans, 66%, according to some research, 66% are either overweight or obese. And it's getting worse. They expect to hit over 70% of our population, overweight over obese or obese. That's not sustainable. That's not something our healthcare system can continue to, to do. We have to start looking at preventative measures. Okay, so the Council for Responsible Nutrition has a foundation. It's a nonprofit foundation. They do a uh, report that looks at how, how we could best help prevent some of these things. What are preventative measures that could actually save us money in our healthcare system. Um, so they put together this report and it just came out yesterday. So I'm actually excited to talk about it very first thing on my Facebook Live. Let me go ahead and put it up in the comments section and then I'll bring it up on the screen. So the, uh, I'll just put it right up on the screen so you can see it. Um, this is the short form link. So if you want the shorter version, the condensed version, Reader's Digest version of this report, you can do it here. Uh, it was re just released August 31st, which is yesterday. Um, uh, if you're watching live, if you're watching later, obviously it's a different day. And in the CRN or uh, Council for Responsible Nutrition Report titled Supplement to Savings, U.S. Healthcare Cost Savings from the Targeted Use of dietary supplements from 2022 to 2030. There's the link for you. You can copy and paste that link or you can pause the video and type down the link in the thing to go see the short form version. I'm gonna go ahead and put in the uh, longer, the uh, complete full report link too as well. Obviously with the same title, but a different link that will take you right to the full report. And I'll go ahead and put that up on the screen for those who want to copy it. Now, you can just pause this video anytime you want, and you can uh, copy that information. So that is the complete report. Now, it's it's really nicely laid out. So if you want to look at just specific supplements and what they can do, or just specific uh, health concerns and how you can tackle them or reduce your risks significantly. So basically what this report is doing is saying, okay, we now have a lot of good information out there, scientific data, published human studies, gold standard, double blind placebo controlled studies, using supplements, showing they reduce risks for certain um, chronic disease states. Now, 
in the supplement industry. We're not allowed to say that, but I'm talking just specifically about what the report is talking about. And, and I'll just lead with their, their main sentence, which is, and this is a direct quote from the report, investing in wellness through supplementation can save billions in disease prevention. And there it is. Those aren't my words. I can't say that legally. The FDA <laughs> handcuffs me. Uh, freedom of speech is not a real thing. Uh, in, in the United States, uh, if you work for a supplement company, you're not allowed to um, say any of the supplements do that, even though there's wide amount of uh, published human studies showing. Otherwise, we're still legally not allowed to say that. Doctors are, and people like the CRN are able to say that. Um, uh, and so I will just directly quote for them. So I'm not uh, infringing on any of the FDA requirements that says we can't say that uh, supplements uh, do anything for any chronic uh, disease state. But clearly they put together an entire report of how different supplements can, through verified published human studies, reduce risk. And what that reduced risk would mean in real dollars in healthcare savings. So let's take a look at uh, some of the supplements that are on the list. Um, uh, first, let me go ahead and read the uh, opening statement. So the CRN Foundation commissioned, and this is quotes again, uh, Frost and Sullivan for analysis of the potential healthcare cost savings that could be realized if certain at-risk individuals were to use certain dietary supplements that have been shown to lower disease risk. In addition, the report examines evidence demonstrating how the use of specific dietary supplements can reduce the direct and indirect medical costs. Some of these are looking at actually the amount of hours that would be lost, work hours. So our efficiency to produce products to produce services for other people greatly impacting our very economy is affected by people being out sick basically or people missing work due to health challenges okay so let's take a look at uh, some of the supplements that they targeted since these were the ones that had the most and greatest effect on different healthcare ones in the macronutrient section, that was the EFAs, which is omega-3. Obviously, we know there's a whole host of published human studies backing up efficacy of omega-3 for a variety of different uh, health promotions. Um, the other one is uh, soluble fiber, and I call it a macronutrient. I think fiber should be called a macronutrient. Most people consider the macronutrients as only uh fatty acids or fats carbs and protein i say fiber is too what is a macronutrient and why is it called macro instead of micro micronutrients are stuff that you only need a small amount like vitamins and milligrams or even micrograms or even nanograms <laughs> um a small amount so micronutrients macronutrients are nutrients we need a lot of like fats and carbs and protein these are stuff that we consume a lot more of measured in grams right um, or a larger amounts of uh, foods so fiber is definitely in there fiber we're we should be getting around 20 grams of fiber per day or more uh depending on who you talk to uh but 24 grams i think uh, i believe is the adult uh, requirement for that i think it should be higher than that i personally uh consume probably close to 100 sometimes over 100 grams of fiber per day um the next is probiotics now, I would cl clump this, and that's my, my personal intake. They put in probiotics as one, but I say if you are feeding yourself healthy amounts of prebiotics, uh, oligosaccharides, which are found in plants too as well, like uh, green bananas, potatoes, uh, starchy vegetables, um, resistant starches, um, also your prebiotic fibers, all your um, different sources like inulin in, in um, uh, onions or mushrooms and stuff like this. And then of course there's postbiotics too, which are the 
the metabolites that the uh, prebiotics actually make. And we've seen a lot of beneficial effects from postbiotics too as well. So I don't think taking prebiotics is probably, there may be some specific cases where a specific pre, uh, probiotic taken can give you a specific effect, especially if you're talking about a chronic disease state, um, there, there is evidence in there. There's some now published human studies coming out showing some good efficacy, even within the sports community too, about uh, increasing um, endurance and things like this. So there is some place for probiotics, but in general, as long as you're eating a lot of good polyphenols, probiotics, uh, starches, oligosaccharides, all these things from plants, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you're feeding this uh, population of probiotics. And if you're getting a diverse type of uh, fruits and vegetables in there, so some of your prebiotics from, uh, from greens, some of them from fruits, some of them from starchy vegetables and beans and grains, these all contribute to up levels of different uh, uh, probiotics in there. So you want a good healthy variety in your gut, uh, microbiome diversity, they call it. That's the healthiest guts, the most diverse guts. So eating a broad spectrum of healthy fruits and whole plant fruits and vegetables is the way to go. Okay, next on the vitamins, vitamin D3, vitamin B, choline, which is technically another vitamin B, and vitamin K2. And then finally, minerals, calcium and magnesium, and then phytonutrients. They only listed two, which is interesting, which is lutein and zeaxanthin. Okay, so why are they listing these specific ones? Because they're targeting very specific um, uh, health conditions that are very expensive for society. Now, I'm going to pull up... Uh, a beautiful thing. I don't know if you'll be able to see this. It may come up on the screen too small. Um, but this is the graph that they put together in the report. You can check it out in the full report. And uh, this graph is actually showing uh, the different health conditions, heart health, obviously, bone health, huge impact of bone health uh, on our healthcare system. Uh, age-related uh, macular degeneration or AMD, which is basically blindness or, or um, uh, eye problems, eye health, uh, brain health, gut health, and then um, further on, let's see what that is, oh, childhood development of a brain health too. Um, so cognitive lines, so brain health on the aging side, as well as the uh, infant to um, childhood development. Uh, brain health. And that's where choline is on this because choline has, has shown uh, some really nice, it's got some really nice published human research um, showing its improvements. And uh, uh, actually a, a really cool one just showed um, taking choline can improve the uptake into the brain of DHA. Now this is kind of interesting because it's a B vitamin, choline is a B vitamin, but it's increasing the uptake in the brain of DHA. Now that's interesting because it's an essential fatty acid. It's an entirely different group. You're talking about a macronutrient, a essential fatty acid being affected by a micronutrient, which is an interesting, uh, an interesting approach. Both DHA and choline are important for the development of brains. That's why this is really important for them. Um, so we're talking about a, a billion dollars in savings just by uh, making sure you're getting sufficient B vitamins, including B12 and choline for a childhood development of the brain. Um, one of the biggest ones here, though, is the osteoporosis. We're talking $155 billion. I mean, uh, that, that's pretty outstanding. I'm going to remove this report so you can see me talking, but uh, the impact of that and, and the uh, relative risk reduction with proper supplementation, vitamin D, vitamin K, calcium, these three big important supplementations. Now, it is possible to get them through your diet, but obviously with vitamin D3, supplementation is really important because normally vitamin D3 is gotten by sun exposure. Vitamin D3 is actually erroneously named. It's not a, it's not a vitamin at all. It's actually a hormone. So it should be called hormone D3. But D3 is generated in our bodies, is produced in our bodies as a reaction from sunlight. Um, so 
we're not in some, we're like me, I'm sitting inside indoors most of the time in the workplace or at home or, you know, uh, in, in a building, even if we're going in entertainment, like a movie or a restaurant, we're inside, we're not getting that direct sunlight like most of the other animals on this planet do in nature. And we're sufficient, insufficient in vitamin D3. Almost 90% of uh, the people that have been tested are, are found to be insufficient for uh, vitamin D3. And, and a big chunk of those uh, actually deficient, which is where you can, can actually run into real true health problems of vitamin D3. So simple thing just to take a vitamin D3 supplement. Uh, I was the first to come out with this, uh, the original organic, the only organic, pure vitamin D3 from organic algae. I love this because most of the um, vegan D3 that I was taking before that, because this was all is available, is either from lichen or mushrooms. I, you know, most of them weren't organic to begin with. And even the mushrooms ones, they actually, mushrooms make vitamin D2 naturally. It's only when they're exposed to direct sunlight that they they switch over to producing vitamin D3. So what you're getting when you get mushroom extracts is probably a little bit of a mix of D2 and D3. And D2 has been shown to interfere uh, and possibly reduce the benefits of vitamin D3. So I wasn't a big fan, but it was the only vegan D3s available out there until this one. Um, this is the first one that's 100% pure vitamin D3. So you're not getting in the uh, impurities like uh, vitamin D2, like you might find in lichen and mushrooms. And it's certified organic, third-party certified organic which is awesome too as well. So it's vegan, certified organic, and 100% pure D3, no impurities like you might find in other uh, forms of um, vitamin D3 that are vegan. So that's why I wanted to put that out there. Obviously, omega-3 has a huge impact on brain, eyes, gut health even now. We're seeing that uh, uh, vitamin uh, omega D3 actually can be metabolized in the gut partially and form some amazing metabolites that are some really cool studies come out. I won't talk about them yet until they're released. I'm, I'm working with a couple of uh, researchers on this, and there's going to be some really interesting metabolites of, of omega-3 that we're just learning about that maybe have some really important health effects. And of course, ahi flower is is the one that's being looked at really closely right now in the research. So ahi flower is the richest source of omega-3 of any plant, non-GMO plant on the planet. It's also the highest in SDA. So SDA is a very potently anti-inflammatory and it converts to EPA at about four times the rate that uh, flax or chia does. And uh, uh, hemp actually has a little bit of SDA, but this has, uh, uh, I think, uh, five times as much SDA and uh, 10 times as much ALA as, as hemp. So it's definitely the omega-3 source, in my opinion. That's why I was the first to bring it to market. It's why it won the Nexty Award for the best supplement of the year. That's the top supplement of the year in, in there. So you're looking at um, some of these other things. So let's go down the list. All right. So omega-3, ahi flower. Um, Omega-3 looking for coronary artery heart disease. Um, they're, they're showing that anywhere from 4 to 16% to basically in the graph reduction. That reduction could uh, uh, affect up to 300,000 people in America alone. 300,000 people. Just if everyone took an omega-3 supplement, we could have... 300,000 potentially less avoidable medical events happening in the United States. That's a huge impact over taking an inexpensive supplement. This is amazing. And this is a third party nonprofit report um, put together on the impact of simply taking specific supplements that have clinical backing, published human studies backing up their effectiveness the rates of effectiveness at reducing risk for health, and then compounding that as, as far as how many people could actually benefit and the overall cost, saving over $83 billion 
just buy an omega-3 supplement. I mean, uh, these add up. When you look at uh, osteoporosis, if you're taking uh, uh, vitamin D3, uh, calcium, magnesium, and vitamin K2. So let's look at clean green protein. All right, clean green protein has 23% of your magnesium in it. Boom, tick one, has 20% of your um, calcium in it. Boom, tick two. And your vitamin K, 1174% of your TV of vitamin K. So what is vitamin K? So vitamin K1 is what's found in clean green protein. It's what's found in most of your dark green veggies. Plants mostly produce vitamin K2. Now, when you ferment vitamin K2, it turns vitamin K1, I'm sorry, it can convert to vitamin K2. Guess what our microbiome is? Yeah, it's a giant fermentation tank. So um, the supplement companies out there that are producing vitamin K2, how do they do it? Well, they take they take soy, right? Soybeans, high in vitamin K1, and then they feed it to bacteria, same bacteria that are in our gut. And what happens? They ferment that soy outside the human body until that K1 is converted to vitamin K2. Well, why not just eat the vitamin K1, let your own fermentation do the work and get all the vitamin K2 that your body needs. Now, you can get tested for vitamin K2. And so you can get tested for all these macro and micronutrients to see if you're in the right levels, to see if your body is sufficiently doing that. Vitamin K2 helps with the uh, uptake of um, calcium into the bones and helps strengthen the bones. It builds the osteocalcin, which does the bridge work framework, all that webbing inside of our bones. That's what makes our bones strong and keeps them healthy and prevents them from breaking. Um, so that alone could save 155 billion just by taking those couple of, couple of supplements. Hey, you're getting almost all of them right here in a single scoop of clean green protein. Um, so you know you're talking about 361,000 medical events avoided just by simply meeting those key nutrients. And the, and the problem is, hey, look, we're just not getting them in our food supply. Unfortunately, our food supply has been processed. It's been monocropped. Monocrop is where they grow the same crop in the same ground, and it just keeps depleting and depleting and depleting the soil, and they don't build back up the soil. All they do is throw cheap fertilizer on there so the plant can survive and grow and then get you. But what that does is mean, yes, the fertilizer will give it nitrogen, and that nitrogen will allow the plant to grow and look pretty, nice and green or reds or blues or all the nice pretty colors, but it won't be nutrient rich because you've depleted the soil where all these calcium and magnesium and your minerals are all coming from. Um, so we're, we're squeezing the soil for its nutrients and not replenishing them in a healthy way. And we need to do that. Bi biodynamic farming is the way to go. We're still a long way from that. Um, so supplementation until we start reversing and changing our own uh, farming practices. So we re-enrich our soils so that we have healthy, rich soils uh, full of fungi, full of bacteria, full of uh, micronutrients and vitamins and minerals that can be absorbed right through the root systems. That will make our food rich and nutritious like it used to be uh, way back in the day when we were either wild harvesting or farming different crops and replenishing the soil and letting the crops die and just plow them right into the soil and refeed the nutrition back to the soil, um, allowing the fungi and the bacteria to 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 chew up all these things and make them bioavailable for the plants. Right now, we're playing pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, bactericides, suicide. <laughs> yes, yeah, suicide. That's what's happening. We're committing suicide through our nutrition by wiping out the nutrition, wiping out the beneficial bacteria in the soil. Soil health is going to be a key issue going forward. So until then, eat as nutritious as you can, eat as many plants as you can, but check your nutrient levels. If they're not there, supplement. Don't just say, hey, wait a minute, I'm eating healthy. That's not how the human body works. It doesn't say, okay, you're eating healthy, good, we're good then. No, it works on whether you're putting in enough nutrients or not. And if you're not and just thinking you are, 
you're putting yourself at risk. And we can see by this amazing chart, the risk is pretty tremendous. We're talking billions and billions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of people, um, you know, just could completely avoid situations by simply taking a few of these specific supplements. This, the, it's a long read on the long form, but for those of you who really want to get interested in the research and why supplements can be such an advantage to you and prevent some things. Um, so uh, I got a question here. I'll go ahead and put it up on the screen. Should vitamin K be taken with vitamin D? Thanks. Okay. Um, so the, I, I'm going to preempt that question, which is, should vitamin K be taken at all? Well, you can get your levels tested to see if you are insufficient in vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 is the one you want. Our body uses both vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. Now, uh, almost 70 to 90% of all of the vitamin K, both one and two that we get are from plants. Humans get are from plants. Um, but the vitamin K is found in plants is vitamin K1 generally, unless it's fermented like kimchi or sauerkraut or, or, or edamame that has been fermented in, in tempeh or something like this. That's, that's when you can find some of the vitamin K2, or you can take a vitamin K2 supplement. But why I don't, I, I put together a whole video on vitamin K2 and why it may not be a concern at all for um, those on a plant pure diet. Okay, so I say plant pure diet because when you consume animal products, you are actually disrupting the microbiome to the point which you can inhibit your body's ability to produce enough K2. So those eating a plant exclusive diet, a vegan diet, a whole food plant, plant only diet, you are probably getting enough as long as you're getting a broad variety and you have a healthy microbiome. So interesting studies on K2. They found that just taking one round of antibiotics lowered your vitamin K2 status by 66%. Okay, so this is telling us really clearly that it's the gut that are actually converting the vitamin K1 to K2. If when you take an antibiotic, you wipe out the gut bacteria. And if they're not there or not there in sufficient quantities, your K2 levels in the bloodstream drop 66%. So if you're taking antibiotics, yes, you should, should consider taking a vitamin K2 supplement because your body may not be, your microbiome may not be in a proper position to produce enough or sufficient vitamin K2. So if you are taking antibiotics or if you're taking something that may disrupt your microbiome, including unfortunately animal products, if you are consuming meat, dairy, eggs, fish even, you're disrupting your microbiome and it could challenge. And they've shown those eating a meat-based diet actually have reduced uh, bacteria that actually do the conversion of vitamin uh, K1 to K2. Now, why is that? Okay, those bacteria that convert vitamin K1 to K2 when they consume it, right? Those bacteria feed on polyphenols, only from plants, fiber, only from plants. Well, if they're feeding on the plant fiber and the plant polyphenols, they're not gonna be able to produce the K2 if you're not feeding them. If they die down because you're not feeding them enough fiber and polyphenols from plant, eating enough plant foods, you're gonna have a very small amount of vitamin K converting bacteria in your gut. The more plants you eat, the more polyphenols, the more whole food plants, that's fiber and polyphenols, oligosaccharides, uh, resistant starches, these feed that bacteria, and then you'll get a lot of conversion. So those on a whole food plant-based diet may get, be getting five, 10 times more vitamin K2 production than those eating a omnivorous diet, uh, including um, other than plants, animal products into their diet and can suppress that amount. So um, the question is, do you need to take vitamin K2 with vitamin D? I, I suggest that people all consider, talk with your physicians, get your vitamin D levels tested. 
Um, but those eating a plant exclusive diet, probably if you have a healthy gut and are not taking antibiotics are probably producing enough B12, uh, K2 rather, and you can get that tested too as well. Now, if you wanna be on the safe side, you can go ahead and do so. Um, but the reason I did this is because I expected, uh, I did not put a K2 in here, although it would have been really inexpensive to do so, because I believe the better way to do this is to simply eat more greens. Your greens, one scoop, one scoop, one scoop of whole food lentine provides 11 times more, almost 12 times more vitamin K than we need for the entire day. So I start my uh, day off with that, just one scoop, and I'm getting almost 12 times the amount of vitamin K that my body needs, which is more than enough in my healthy microbiome to convert to vitamin K2 to build strong and healthy bones. That's why I can push 400 you know, 50 pounds uh, and a de decline bench press at, at almost the age of 60, just five months away from 60, I can do that. And my bones are healthy and strong. That's vitamin K2. There's, I go into it uh, in more depth in my uh, video on K2. Go to Clean Machine Online uh, YouTube and you can just check out our type in a vitamin K2 and you can see it there. I go into deep dive and why uh, those eating a plant pure diet, a vegan diet, uh, probably as long as you're not taking antibiotics, you're probably getting far enough uh, vitamin K2. So just these three supplements, you're getting your B12, getting your magnesium, getting your calcium. Remember, clean green protein, this is actually from whole food plant source, the lentine, all these nutrients are coming from a whole food source. So you're getting actually real whole food in there too as well. The richest source of omega-3 on the planet and the only 100% pure organic D3 from algae. So there you go. Save some money, save the economy, save our healthcare system by simply making sure you're getting sufficient amounts of these nutrients into your diet and you're going to be better off. You're going to prevent some major, uh, well, according to this study, let me say it this way. According to this report, there is a significant amount, and I'll just read it verbatim so I don't get myself in trouble with the FDA again. Uh, I'll read it uh, verbatim as a quote, investing in wellness through supplementation can save billions in disease prevention, end quote. So I hope you enjoyed this in video. Please take it seriously. I realize there are people out there who want to do it completely natural, whole food. I applaud you for that. But be honest with yourself. If you are tested and you are not getting it through your diet, either change your diet to include these on a regular basis or supplement to safeguard so that you are getting that. Don't get so tied into your own personal dogma that, no, I'm not going to take supplements. Supplements are bad. Stop with that. They, they're clinically proven in multiple human studies. A giant CRN report showing their risk reduction and backed by human studies. So, you know, come on, let's let's stop with the, the dogma and, and let's talk about real nutrition, real health, because your body doesn't respond to what you think you're getting in nutrition. It responds to what goes into your mouth as far as nutrition. So make sure you're getting enough either through the food or through supplementation or both like I do. I'm whole food plant-based for vast majority of my food, but I supplement to make sure that I'm getting the best out of life, be the strongest and healthiest, even at my age at almost 60 years of age and enjoy the hell out of life <laughs> while I can. So I hope you enjoyed this one. Share if you can, give it a thumbs up, like us on uh, YouTube uh, or subscribe too as well so you can catch all these good videos. I am bringing you this uh, report a day after it came out. So you'll always uh, find me combing the, the resources out there to bring you the best information like this wonderful healthcare cost savings report from this, the Council for Responsible Nutrition. And I believe in that too.
responsible nutrition. Not all supplements work. Not all supplements are made by good supplement companies. And that's why I'm out there. Why I named my company Clean Machine is to offer something better that is truly backed by published human studies and will promote health as well as fitness benefits. Here's to your health. Enjoy the day. Have fun and be healthy.